Game number one, ladies. It is the last best of five series in the official season, the first season of Division S, in Europe at least. So after this, the playoffs will happen. That's going to take us another week or two, and then the playoffs will start. But for now, this is the last game of the first season, so it's actually pretty awesome. We have washed up against LFT today, and Towers of Doom is our first map. We have two sub-players on the side of washed up. In the last few weeks, it already became a little bit clear that Eternal isn't really investing that much time here in the Heroes. JPL occasionally missing as well. So X-Ray and Sport Billy are currently subbing in for Washed Up. Billy has already subbed several times in the past for the team, so did X-Ray. So they're definitely very familiar with the lineup that they're playing here. And the first thing that happens is that Diablo gets banned out against Masquerade. Masquerade has been playing a lot of Dibbles in his frontline can be quite terrifying as a mean Tyrael as well Mana is back to business this is more the original washed up lineup again we had just recently in a different tournament series washed up 2.0 which featured Nick for example and Chris so the teams are definitely a little bit more flexible these days but as we are now in Division S obviously at least the base of the team is still exactly the same Smexy is playing here too he already tweeted out something earlier that he very likely won't be able to join the team for the playoffs Smexy currently active as a coach or manager for the Fnatic Apex team so he's starting to shift more of his attention towards that as well if he's going to play then after the players in a potential second season of Division S that's to be seen but at least in our current best of five series here in Towers we have now Zeratul banned out and we see the ban against Alarak again that oftentimes comes in against Mena since he wants to put, uh, play this particular setup but yeah with currently this, what do we have as our last and final ban for our first phase from the franchise, the baguettes? What are they gonna do? LFT bans out. Ah, no. could have been a ban against Mayev, even though she has fallen in priority a little bit. She's normally now banned later or even taken. I've seen, seen games where she was completely ignored too. It's a big map again. Abathai is an option on this map for sure. You can go into a Dehaka setup later on in the draft. Don't really expect that as a first pick. Oftentimes on the first rotation, we still have something along the lines of a Nuburak, which in this case is actually getting picked. So Sport Billy with the engage, followed up usually by either Malfurion or Turana, trying to play around that. Burst damage comes in with it as well, where Jaina oftentimes becomes the tool that you want to have there. Even though I gotta admit that just recently Jaina has been falling off a little bit. Now with Turanda and Hanzo already picked, that also means that you don't have Li Ming against the Nuburak, which is actually important because Li Ming's Disintegrate is a fantastic tool against the Nuburak's Cocoon, and Li Ming has established herself for nearly two years now as pretty much a counter pick against the Nuburak. There's still this idea that especially exists on the lower levels, the lower you go in uh, the rankings, the more people believe that the Nuburak is a counter against Li Ming because he spawns beetles and some of those shots get soaked by, uh, 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 get soaked from Li Ming. But nothing could be further from the truth. Anybody that watched HEC for a long time or even after that knows that it's exactly the other way around and the good Li Ming players will always be able to play around him. Leo now taken also for the rotation between the middle and the top and trying to get the wave clear pressure against the opponent. As mentioned before, we have now that Malfurion pick that I already alluded to since Toronto was taken on the side of Banana Age. And the band's gonna keep coming in again. Smexy the last time has actually played damage since X-Ray went over into the support and it seems like we're gonna see that again. There's the Jaina ban. I talked at the beginning about how a new Brock gets normally paired with a mage that can get burst damage out and highlighted Jaina as a specific case for that. And LFT agrees with it and they're saying, okay, now that you have already a lineup where you could lock one of our heroes down, let's get Jaina out of the equation so that you have a harder time killing those guys. So with that, what well, gets banned out by Washed Up. The red team takes away Garrosh, which means that we're now having three frontliners already eliminated from the pool that LFT can rely upon. They still have the option to go into Tyrrell, into Johanna, and also into Muradin. So all three of them would be decent picks here and can definitely be taken. And there's not only the question what Masquerade really prefers. But you want to have kind of the setup stun for Turanda, and that can be either one of the heroes that I just pointed out. Maybe with the exception of Tyrael, for him you would normally look into something a bit different here. ETC, also always a highlight, and in this case they even rely upon him as an early pick. Malthale with a new skin, unfortunately the wrong tint, the white one looks way better. 
Yeah, Dequaza, quick tip for you. White tint. Fantastic. And Vala gets taken as well. The mana takes Vala and is going to try and weave in those auto attacks. Which me leaves the question, is that going to be a Tassadar pick? Yes, it is! Tassadar for Smexy. Double support Vala, a bit more popular lately again. And now, of course, Kolios, the last pick on the side of LFT. And there it is! Mayev, we talked about her earlier. Now she gets picked. Game number one, another best of five series here in Europe. And we're heading into Towers of Doom, our first map of the set. Game on! LFT on the left side with Masquerade on ETC, Banana Age on Turanda. We have Dequaza on Malfail, Tobos on Hanzo, and Kolios on Maev. Washed up on the other side towards the right with a double support Vala setup. Main on Vala for the auto attacks here. We have Hazo Ops on Leoric, Smexy on Tassadar, X Ray on Malfurion, and Sport Billy is playing a Nuburak in our first game. And yeah, we're good to go. We're already having on level one a Psyon Fusion, as you would expect. On a pale horse for Malthail. Is obviously going to attempt to meet those rotations that we'll see from Hazops on Leoric. Quick dodge on the Owl, at least from a few of the players. Not all were able to make that happen. And on level one, as usual, the Hot Pursuit. So very likely we're gonna see Actually, I'm honestly a little bit intrigued of what they're going to do, but I mean, the standard build for Vala is and still remains the hybrid multi-shot build. So we would normally see punishment then on level 4, unless you're playing on a map like Battlefield of Eternity, where you traditionally switch your build up into an arrow build. An arrow build is flexible enough that it can be played on other maps as well, but the standard build outside of BOE is still the uh, multi-shot hybrid. That's uh, the, the common answer here for most of those. But obviously it's all about the format right now. If you're going for a setup like this, you're trying to rotate as four, you're trying to stick together as a group as much as you can, whereas Leo finds himself in the solo lane. But especially the two supports need to be close to Vala since they are their own... Well, it's not their own job, but their main job is to protect the damage dealer. Once that Vala goes down, all your ambitions of taking a team fight are usually ending very quickly. So Mena is going to try and weave that in as much as he can. And as I say that, we're still seeing Dequaza with these rotations too. That's the reason why he has on a pale horse here. Because he is a little bit quicker making that rotation. Now Zerps has to try and keep up with that. Now that we're having also the pumpkin camps on the map, it means that both of the teams are focusing on those very quickly. And are starting to go straight for them. Masquerade starts to move in now too. Kolios is already uh, sitting here waiting for that tether. And this is actually a bit of a dirty setup. I mean, if you play that right and you tether and power slide in conjunction, you can make a lot of plays there and set up the stun for Toranda as well, which leads you off times towards a kill opportunity. And that's exactly what they're going to try and do here. And they have to attempt to do that against Vala in particular, but anybody that they really can get their hands on. And Nubarak will try and interrupt it as much as he can. And here it is. Punishment is taken. Oh, there we go. Billy <laughs> goes away. I was just waiting for my head to jump in for a tether. I was honestly for just a second hesitating a little bit on Mena because I definitely know, because I talked to him quite a lot about it, that he thinks that Creed of the Hunter, for good reason, is a pretty garbage talent in a competitive setup. But since they have been memeing a little bit lately, and are oftentimes in early games trying to see what they can get away with, I wouldn't have put it past them to say like, listen, I'm a mechanical god anyways, I can make Creed work here with that double support. But yeah, he still goes into the normal, into the normal set. And believe me, I have heard him swear more than one time when he saw that someone went into a creed instead for a traditional build. And he does want to make sure that Vala is represented here accurately because the hero is still absolutely amazing and needs to be treated accordingly. Okay, so Triple Alter Phase is ready on the map and that gives us the channel at the top left. At the top right, Hazops is doing the same thing. So the normal exchange between bell towers with the final fight at the bottom of the map. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. With an attempted kill against Masquerade's ETC. It does not go through here. Also on level 4, Tassadar with the extra life leash. So Smexy 
playing around that, making sure that they have a chance there. The Quaza is putting additional pressure onto Billy. And Main is also in slight trouble, but the heal from Milfurion is there, and that's not the only thing. Smexy has the shield ready once more and is able to get that through. Talking about getting things through, Azu! Oh, he gets interrupted! <laughs> That was pitch perfect on the frame as we've seen Hans over the interrupt. But now they're still trying to go for that channel, doing whatever they can here. Everybody else already on the rotation. Mena jumping in, getting a few additional hits in against Hans in that back line. Shields, of course, helping him out with the extra life leech to have that self sustain. But it's still a tight battle for this one. Now Leo is rotating in too. We already saw Malphael arrive a little bit earlier. So uh, Leo after he wasn't able to channel originally, is trying to come in from the middle again after clearing away. Main is isolated, and that's the end of the hyper carry. And that usually is the immediate end of the fight as well if you're playing a double support hyper carry setup. They might be able to interrupt for a little bit longer simply because they have Moonfire available and also Tacita for the Storms. If they really are eager to make a play here, they might be able to delay it a little bit longer and get Vala back into the action. It seems like this is exactly what we're going to see. At least for the time being, there's the Tether. X-Ray in trouble. Azorbs with a nice slow, nice choke point control here from Washed Up. And they nearly get a kill, but so did LFT. Tobos wants once more to check at the channel through. Vala's back to business. Five versus five again. And it is really getting a bit nasty. Which is actually amazing for Tacita. He's already halfway done with his quest. Gets the first quest reward. And washed up. Walks away with a hit on the core. Nicely played by them. Malthale was already topside. So now we have that slight lead for LFT. They obviously also have the lead in kills. Since they got the only kill in the game. But that was definitely a good setup right now, and a very long first objective, too. Power slide attempt against Smexy, that failed. Didn't do a lot here for them. Having also now with level 7, amongst other things, the uh, Katina's plating taken after the Shed Exoskeleton. Full carapace build for Sport Billy now. On level. Ooh, Smexy! Oh, Tacita goes down. Didn't have that dimensional shift anymore. Banana H though gets dropped by Vala, but Mene dies to Hanzo. No Tacita around anymore to give him the shield. X-Ray also low. Ace able to save himself. No! Hanzo comes in again with a final hit here. Uh, that's two more kills for LFT. They take that lead. They have four kills against one. They are also getting closer to level 10. Still behind at the objective, but at least the lead in talents is theirs. So with that, we have now... Ah, talents is expected. I guess the only one that he could have thought about is going stage dive, but even that is a bit of a stretch considering that they're playing with Malthael on the side lane. So they have now last rights. Four last named hero. We have in the mosh pit. And yeah, with level 10 now on both, we have Reign of Vengeance for Mena. There's the Cocoon too. They need to burn that down somehow. LFT that is. Single altar on the map. Already dancing around it. Tacita with the Archon and Twilight Dream for Malfury and with a double setup. And the one versus one at the top continues. And obviously Liu has now to be careful as he's gonna fall victim to the last rides. But down here the four versus four is nasty. LFT needs to contest against the double support, and that's never easy, especially in the early stages. But they have the lockdown and Banana H is already trying uh, the channel. To rotate away here before the engage happens. There's the damage against the Nubarak and Billy barely moving out. There's Malthil and also Azorbs as they're starting to join the fight here, making it a five versus five. Kolios again coming in. The storm is controlling quite nicely the positioning around the altar from LFT. And both of the teams just eager to poke. And for Smexy, that means again a massive amount of stacks for his level one. There's the cage on the ground, and that bug got solved already. There's a lot of bug fixing that goes on from LFT. I think they all learn to code here. So Mena already sitting at the side with a bit more damage on his part, but obviously without that tank. That's pretty much out there. 27,000 on the side of Hanzo and on Vala. Zero deaths on Leo so far. So Hanzo Ops didn't activate the trade value yet. But with five kills against one, LFT is looking quite good here. Honestly, I mean, they're looking really strong. And this would be a fantastic win for them. They would definitely improve their standings and jump up another slot or two. 
which is for the playoffs obviously highly important as well but washed up they have also a very real interest to win this one and establish themselves in the number two position in the standings just behind granite gaming so yeah with that let's have another quick look at also the stacks for tassila because once that he has the extra damage he can soften the targets up even more that's going to be important for his level 16 as well Mene again in trouble mosh pit is there and that's a kill against Mene again an x-ray goes down to lft let's be honest here for a second they are currently demolishing washed up it's even points on the core now but the momentum on the map is in the hands of the french team the baguettes are definitely starting to rock this so they have established themselves in a really nice setup have their baguettes ready there's a little bit of camembert in play and a good red wine so the french are happy food is good and with that they can now try and make the play for nubarak again and guess what billy if he doesn't die he's at least forced to move back here and that allows them to take the bell tower level 13 with the inevitable end and the french are looking good Washed up on the other hand with a lot of trouble right now. Not really that start into the series that they were hoping for and by no means do they seem to have any control over this. Yes, Last Rites has one stack so far. In this case, Leo died quite quickly. Reign of Vengeance on the other hand. Is that going to be enough? As the cage, they go for the camp, but they lose Malfuria and X-Ray is down. Smexy. God, and Nubarak is dead again too. 10 kills against one as Washed Up gets just washed off the map here. This is not pretty for the uh, for the red team in the slightest. I mean, damn, son. 10 kills against one, two levels ahead. The talent advantage that we're seeing. <sighs> it's rough. I mean, again, the Frenchies, they're doing wonders here. Now, I heard there's a little bit of a heat wave in Central Europe right now. Gotta be quite honest with you. When we're talking about Spain, the weather's currently quite nice. Hot, but nice. But at least in France and in Germany, uh, temperatures have been crazy. Up to 40 degrees Celsius. And it seems like the uh, French team can deal with that a little bit better. Because they are on fire right now in game number one. There's the stun again. The damage against Billy. Counter stun. Dequaza already moving in. Hoping to get another last right stacks. Couldn't realize that. But we still have that big lead. And we're going to see level 16 talents. And that's another huge advantage for our franchise. 38,000 against 42,000. That might be a kill. And that is a kill. All right. Maybe now we're talking. Down goes Malthael, and that at least for now takes the wind out of the sails of LFT. And that comes just as we're having a double alt on the map. If they can get another kill, that would be great. But obviously, they're soon going to be behind the talent. They're trying to make the play for my F arrow. Billy gets the shield and the carapace. Kolios, oh, jumps in because the mosh pit hits, and Vala goes down again. Oh, have four versus five, and they get two kills. LFT looking strong right now. Smexy with the channel attempt has already has a kiss that idea goodbye, and that should be a double altar now for the blue team. And again, there's definitely the late tactic going on. Mayev on the way back down to the bottom to at least secure one, and that would be ten points off the core of <coughs> washed up. And here we go. Five down, and another five fired. Seventeen. Seventeen against thirty-two now. Still the defense at the bottom. I mean, th again, this is not going to hold for much longer because obviously a little bit of distance poke from Tacita is going to reclaim that bell tower. But it's still a really, really strong setup now. Thirty-two points against seventeen. I mean, by no means are you out of the run yet to win this map. Especially not on Towers of Doom. I mean, this is one of the best maps for a comeback. All you have to do is really draw even with your opponent on talents or experience and then gain momentum through a team fight victory. And it can oftentimes turn things around. But it is definitely something to worry about right now for Washed Up. But we have 16 now for both of the teams. And that gives us also the Frost Shot for a bit more control. We're having also the Epicenter that alone is oftentimes a game changer. And let's not forget that with a double storm thanks to the psionic echo it's another huge advantage and once level 20 drops into their hands they also have access to buried alive 
So that's a lot of good tools that they have. Can they take ETC now? That's the next question. Oh, there's one setup, there's two. They're really trying to go for the kill, but ETC slides back. Five seconds for him to get the uh, mosh pit also back up. Tobos jumps out as the Entomb comes through. Hits the arrow straight into Leo's face. And the two teams move away as we have not a single kill yet in this fight at least. 12 against 2, triple altar phase now too. Uh, and Leo on the move up towards the top. Yeah, well as usual already I'm just realizing that I took one of my socks off again. And you know how I realized that? Because my foot got a little bit cold. So sock is back on, we are ready for the next big play. And that comes just as we have at the double, our, again, channel on the left and the right, so that's going to be an easy exchange, whereas down at the bottom, the poke has continued. A thousand stacks now for Smexy, he has the extra damage, he has the double storm, and they can soften these targets up slowly and steadily. Malthale comes out now too, so they have to be careful with the additional, well, last rites that comes into play. Masquerade with a tactical pause right there, 3-2-3 three three moment, hashtag know your meme. And obviously we're now seeing the team in red also rotating the offlaner down as they're going to attempt to use Hanzo Ops to drop another quick entomb and drop the target. Tobo's already jumping in on the other hand and I mean he is a little bit in trouble. That's a Hanzo right there. So if he gets actually locked down by any means at this point they might be able to get the kill against him. But especially as the Quasar rotates in with Malthale, there's always a chance that they have an opportunity to maybe get a kill through that. Either way, this one is going to be important. Right now we're having 28 points against 13 on the core, with both of the teams now holding four bell towers. That would mean that if LVLFT gets this one, it's single digits for washed up. And then you're pretty much talking about just losing some kind of momentum on the map, losing a pumpkin camp, losing another bell tower, and a boss being taken, and it slides out. So that would be a problem. When it comes to the Marthel stacks, at least there's only one that's something that speaks in favor of washed up, as they still have an opportunity to make sure that not too much is happening there from a damage perspective. But either way, talking damage, just take a quick look at it. 57,000 already by Hanzo. And there's obviously a lot of poke coming through that as Hanzo jumps out of the fight. Again, he was a little bit deep there. But we're having 55,000 now for Vada, so she's definitely starting to catch up with him. And Mena has died four times. He is the center of attention, which is normally the case if you play Hyper Carry for good reason. But here comes the Entomb, and that's maybe enough to take Masquerade down. Moshpit comes in, but ETC is dead. The Quasa is also low. That should be another kill, and it is. Sport Billy survives as the last rides pops onto him, and bam! Washed up is back to. Yeah, back to business with the four shots fired now. But Hanzo was still sitting there and shitting on Mena a little bit. Five deaths on Mena right now. Yeah, and Tobo is saying, well, I got that one at least. It's still a two-for-one trade, and that bottom bell tower is under pressure. Uh, Billy himself also needs to be careful because Tobus is already looking for the next victim. But damn, that was a quick turnaround right there. I don't think that Mane really expected that damage to be pushed out and kind of overestimated his own hit point pool. But again, you look at the map, and the momentum is starting to swing. Bottom lane control is in the hands of Washed Up now. Yes, they are behind by quite a bit in points on the core. And they obviously need Vala back for more action. But still, this is something that is starting to work for them. Zonard is there. Good route, but it's still a... Ch yeah, they steal it away. The French, they steal the pumpkins away. No chance to take those. And that obviously helps with reclaiming that bell tower. I feel that, uh, that uh, Sport Beauty already thought that he had it safe, but nothing could have been further from the truth. Now the engage again with the epicenter here, as they're trying to hold on to this. Experience lead, of course, starts to matter now too, since that level 20 talent is something that you want to have. Uh, that steal. Now we saw the camp was actually pretty solid. Mm. Yeah. That was a nice attempt there in the middle, but uh, again, you need a little bit more damage on foot in order to make that work. Main is already working on the camp, but obviously down to the bottom, that bell tower is going to be lost soon. Smexy's trying to hold it for a bit longer thanks to the shields. But Hanzo is just Hanzo, and he is going to just poke, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. 
Top left, top right, still the exchange in Bell Tower, so that means that at least five shots fired, so the Bell Tower is reclaimed, but not in time to prevent that from happening. 19 points against 10. So we're actually still having that lead for LFT, especially now that they have level 20, but there's currently no pressure against Boshed Up. They can safely sit there, get their own level 20, and they play, then play around that. This is a bit of a concern, obviously, for the red team, since they're going to lose this eventually if there's another push through the top lane. But mostly the focus will be at the bottom of the map either way. Okay, Billy, that's trying to attack him. Once 20 is there, buried alive is going to be the biggest problem. That is maybe them overstaying a little bit. Arrow gets dodged, okay. Uh, missed them. By a very narrow margin. But now has ops with the potential buried alive. And no. Ah, oh, he drops it. But that might have been a little bit too, uh, too late here. They get the kill in the back line though. My F was isolated and she goes down. The cocoon is on the ground too. And that might be the end of ETC if they play their cards right. But he actually escapes here. Has still the mosh pit too. And is also looking at the bolt of the storm, which helps him, of course, with the escape on top of that. And there's the pressure again against the bell tower. This time it's the middle of they're focusing on. There's the mosh pit though and the insta interrupt. But Hazu is about to fall and that's the second stack acquired for the last rides on Malfael as well. Uh, so far so good. But still the damage for Main in particular as they're trying to go for that bell tower. Main is now currently sitting at 70,000 damage. Tassada by the way on 52,000. So not really too bad either. Billy! Yeah, they get the kill again. And Nubora gets racked for the third time here. And just 15 kills against 5. It's honestly a little bit amazing to see the small advantage that LFT has considering that they have three times the kills that Wash Up was able to get throughout the game. But with the new Barak now dead for another 40 seconds, this is still a problem. But one altar gets channeled by the red team. And now we're having 15 points against 10. Even if LFT gets the one at the bottom of the map, it would still mean that there's a chance for Wash Up to come back into this. Honestly, this series has started off with a great game here. Ah, no fucking way! They actually take the kill of the fantastic Buried Alive against ETC. A 4 versus 5 and they take it and they get 3 kills. You gotta be shitting me. Why exactly do they need an Uberrock? Can someone again just tell me? Because <laughs> I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> So they are able to get three kills being a ta sorry, being a hero down, and now they gain all the momentum in the world. It's a fantastic first map that we have here. An epic start into this series for sure. And it is not over yet. So they're going straight to the bottom, and they're trying to get the bell tower in the middle apparently too, so that they have six points that they can take off the opponent's score. Screw the six up at the top. This one got reconfirmed as well, so it's going to be five. But they're going to get those five. Five shots will be fired. And, well, everybody that uh, passed first grade knows what that means. It's going to be even. 15 points or, uh, minus five. That's 10 on both sides. And we are in a draw situation. Actually, we are in an advantageous situation for Washed Up because they have better control over the bell towers in general. And again, up at the top, Leo has to deal with the pumpkins, and he's doing exactly that, so that those three shots aren't fired. It comes down to every single shot at this point. I mean, every single shot really matters here now. A four-man defense at the bottom of the map, as the French are five-manning the bot lane. Leo has taken this over, though, so he takes all of the pumpkins down. He could now start the rotation if he wanted to, to help out the rest of the team, unless his goal is to reclaim the bell tower single-handedly. And he's not doing that just now. We are already seeing him on the way back to the rest of the pack. 22 versus 22. We're 21 and a half minutes into the game as well. And now at least the mid lane gets reclaimed. Twilight Archon can be used by Smexy. On top of that, we have the No One Can Stop Death. And uh, Mouth is just looking at this and just saying like, well, you watch me. So there we go. Another chance to turn this around. Oh! <laughs> the absolute lockdown stun thanks to the bullseye against Tassada. And he's dead. Banana H nearly falls too. They're again taking the fight even though down. Great silence here again. No one, Malfael. No way. 
He survives twice with basically no HP and then the mosh pit delivers a triple kill into the hands of LF LFT. What a setup! Martha Ale was about to die several times and now it could be even a five-man team wipe, but Billy gets away already top right martha has rotated over they're trying to end the game right now and i really feel that they will make this happen the nuburak is trying to be there in time but now with five bell towers against three they only need the two altars and that's exactly what's happening bam there's the first five shots fired what an insane last fight here leo on the run towards the top left martha is already channeling sport billy comes in is interrupting on the last moment but gets squashed Within a second, Leo is coming back too. He's of course trying to interrupt it as well, but he's going to fall. Gets a four-man buried alive through, but it doesn't even matter anymore. Nobody else. Well, actually, Tassadar is going to be able to get the storm in, but obviously he won't be able to make much of a difference here either, even with the Twilight Archon. And that is the death on him. Yep, Smexy down, 22 kills against zero. Now nobody left to interrupt the channel. And that is game, ladies and gentlemen. That is game. Five shots fired, and we have the 1-0 lead for LFT against Washed Up in the Division S match in Europe. GG, and well played. Game on! We have Towers of Doom ending in favor of LFT. And now on map number two, Tomb of the Spider Queen, there's a chance for Washed Up to turn things around. It is actually the map choice of LFT, so Washed Up went into first pick, first ban. But yeah, we're in an interesting setup right now because all of a sudden Washed Up is behind. I don't really think they expected this against LFT. LFT was this weird team all season. It's honestly a bit of a strange one. Coming into the season, I expected them to aggressively attack the top three, top four, and then they've kind of fallen off a little bit. They were always in the middle, sometimes having a streak, sometimes starting to lose games where you would expect them to win. But in this series, they do well, and they were always on the brink of just starting to jump up. And Washed Up is trying to get that number two spot in the standing so that they have a great setup for the playoffs. And this is the last, the last series. So now the question is just, can they take down LFT because right now the French after the first map they are looking strong here We have Alarak already banned out again as previously against Mena This is also a map where Mena in the past played a bit of Keltha so we could see that again But we're having banned out Mayev and with that together Diablo Okay, so first pick what are we gonna have from washed up now? We saw the Nubarak first pick the last time and you can still do that here But this is of course a bit of a different map and a different style and they actually go into Turandi here first A couple of heroes that really start to gain more value here is for example Junkrat You get a lot more out of him. You, you can play Kalthas if you want to There's not a lot of teams in Division S that really look at Kalthas, but Mena is one of the players that picks him occasionally so with that, Malfurion, picked by Banana Age, Tobos, shocking on Hanzo again. Who would have thought? I mean, this has been so consistent throughout the entire season. And what are the picks now for Washed Up? What are they going to get from them? Personally, I expect that they are focusing onto the main tank right now. And maybe even ban out another one then shortly after. Jojo, if you want to go for the wave clear, is always an option. You can go for Garrosh. There's the Kalthas pick, exactly. Main delivering again. And there's Jojo. All right. So, we are already set and ready. That means that we have now Gravity Labs, CC, Tyrande Stun, Johanna with a shield, and also Condemn plus Slow through Punish. And what do you ban out now? You can still ban the offlane. Hazo played a lot of Rexa here. So, since Hazo is today taking the offlane again, that might be a ban that is at least worth thinking about, because Hazo has been playing this on Tomb of the Spider Queen a lot. There it is. There's the ban. So LFT definitely did their homework and watched a lot of these games. I like that. So definitely good for them. There's still Leo to consider, even though I personally would expect that LFT is already thinking about picking Leo for themselves. Another hero that could be taken by either one of the teams is Thrall. That's another good choice for uh, the map. But let's see what Washed Up is banning out first of all. Again, they can ban out Garrosh, for example, if they want to get rid of a bit more frontline and limit the options of uh, Masquerade. And instead it's Stitches. 
I mean, there's already a Malfurion, so you can argue that that route on the ground would be a problem. And there's a double pick. Are we going to see that Leo? That's my first question. Because if they don't take Leo, I pretty much can guarantee you that Wash Washed Up will. And they do. I shall suffer. Swiffer, baby. And Gul'dan. All right. Yeah, pretty much the setups that we expected. So on the off lane, four washed up, Thrall would be a good option. They have a few more, obviously, but he is one of the picks that Hazo has in the past oftentimes taken. So that could be the choice here if they feel safe enough to play Johanna as the main option. Ooh, Smexion and Zeratul, okay. That changes things, obviously. And that gives us the Junkrat that I was highlighting at the beginning of the draft with the added value since you can poke out the channel of your opponent quite easily and get value through that, try and control the objective even more. So yeah, Smexion and Zeratul. Interesting. Uh, find out how that looks gonna work for them. Masquerade, is it gonna be uh, that Garrosh that we mentioned, or is he going to move into something else? ETC is still open. You could even go Muradin if you wanted to, but... Tyrael. Tyrael it is. All right, fair enough. So the extra shield's coming out. Game number two, everybody. Already a lead for LFT. Can they make it 2-0? Or will Wash Up force the third map on an even score? We're gonna find out right now. In game number two, we have Masquerade for LFT on the left side. Interior, Tobos on Gul'dan this time, as Corius is actually one that's jumping on Hanzo. Dequaza on Leoric, and Banana Age on Malfurion. Every single time that I read that Banana Age thing, I'm thinking about a good old banana split, and I'm just getting hungry. I want some ice cream. So, yeah, I am just... Ooh... Ooh, baby, give me that ice cream. I want to have a banana split right now. At least a banana smoothie. At least something along those lines. God, I have to stop thinking about this. It's so hot right now in Europe. That would absolutely be perfect. Either way, towards the right side. Hazops on Junkrat. Smexy on Zeratul. X-Ray on Taranda. Mena on Kelthas. And Billy on Johanna. And already on level 1, we're seeing that we have the Cleave build for Zeratul. Lately, more popular to go also in the auto attack build. So we'll see how that works, but for now, or how often we'll see that in the playoffs. But for now, we're getting the cleave build again. Okay, so we are having uh, on level one, four Gul'dan, still the Echoed Corruption, so that's going to be a thing. And in the meantime, Kolios with his little snowflake over here. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings involved in this game, apparently. Or Kolios is just because of the European heat wave so hot right now that he feels that anything that resembles cold, even if it's just in-game, will give him a little bit of relief here. The problem is that Mena has very different plans for the opponent's team and it's just raining down fire everywhere. And since everything in Europe is currently as dry as Kindle, there's a good chance that Mena is going to create a massive wave of fire in this game. It's not quite Ragnaros, but still, you could see something like that. Either way, we have four mana, obviously the Mana Addict on level one. They get the Gravity Lapse against Masquerade, and whoop whoop, Tyriel is dead. Ah, that lockdown from mana is pretty solid. This is one of the really cool things when you have an absolute top-notch Kel'thas player in your lineup. The coordination around the Gravity Lapse and the timing on that is usually just absolutely perfect. And Mena is probably one of the best, if not the best, Kalthas player that we have in Europe. Riding also on the money pick, which is always an added bonus. It puts the fear into the heart of your opponent, makes, makes them scared for their life as the oink oink runs towards them. And you just can't beat that. It's a living piece of bacon and yeah, it's terrifying. So you gotta be careful there. You have to watch your cholesterol. The rotation now after the Siege Giant camp was taken. I came at the... Uh, just after the kill. So it was actually pretty cool because they used that kill to get an immediate advantage at the bot lane that they are already pushing through here. Uh, X-Ray still waiting for those stuns. And on level 4 now, having amongst other things the cleave build continuing and obviously the nether wenders too. Main in a bit of trouble here. Wants to go in with the damage once more. Very likely that he adds into a flame strike build again. Usually it's the burn flesh on level 7 for him. But... Uh, with the Sopa already moving into the middle. We'll see if the French can actually start to turn this around. Because right now, Washed Up is doing well. More gems turned in, slight lead in experience. They have the kill advantage, and they're currently controlling the rotation quite nicely. So things are looking good. No massive lead just yet, don't get me wrong. 
but it's a small advantage. And Mina is just sitting there firing away with those living bombs. Ah, salami. Ashlanore. Yeah, we know how he likes his pizza. And I don't begrudge him that at the slightest. I mean, I like salami on my pizza as much as the next guy. Pepperoni is always a nice one. And obviously, one of the best ingredients for any kind of pizza that you could possibly have is always pineapple. And yeah, I mean, there's no discussion around that either. We all know that pineapple is just a superior ingredient for a fantastic pizza. And yeah, everybody agrees. So this is one of the cool things that there is just no other opinion on that. Azops jumping out as there's a bit of a focus on him for just a moment, but Banana H was low, so they had to be careful around him. Having in the meantime, Mena, again, this is the poke at the turn. This is just the one thing that's perfect around a setup like this. You have Tyrande for the interrupt, you have the flashlight on Johanna that can do pretty much the same thing. Junkrat is poking from the outside, and Kelthas is moving in too, and it's absolutely fantastic. If Jojo sucks them in with a the Condemn, then Mena is immediately there, dropping another Flame Strike. As expected on level 7, it's the burn Flesh for him now already. And yeah, things are looking pretty good from an interrupt perspective. This is the objective control that we are seeing here a lot. So it's a very solid setup for them. The level 7 abilities for the opponent's teams are now also finally ready, which gives us obviously the nature's cure again for Malfurion. Uh, Smexy, let's see if we can maybe at least clear the wave together with Mena. This is the drain, they got a bit careful. Level 10s are gonna change a lot here. Again, we're talking on level 10 about Horrify and Tomb and also Hanzo's Arrow. So there is a lot of tools available later on for LFT to put Wash up into some real trouble. And there's already another killer. Smexy goes in and gets the drop on Hanzo. Smexy himself now low though. Ooh! <laughs> Oh, he actually survives for a little bit longer and that allows them to get at least a second kill in against Kul'dan, but he himself has fallen. Now they're trying to make another play for Masquerade and it looks like they're gonna get that kill, or are they? 20 HP at some point, but he's still able to move away. Has Ops now with a turn in on this side and uh, Sport Billy is already on the case too. They definitely have the advantage right now in gems and they're using that to secure the first Web Weaver wave for themselves right there. Yeah, top lane, Mena pushes this wave out again. So Mena is currently in a spot where he should even have top damage in uh, this game. And indeed he does. Uh, well, on his team that is. 11,000, nearly 12. Uh, starting to rotate over here. Trying maybe to jump onto Leo on the bot lane. They're not making that move just yet. Instead it's the mid lane they're focusing on. Mena missing the gravity laps here for once. Yeah, could not connect that. Everybody was already moving out a bit quicker than they expected, I suppose. But there's the push coming, and it's only the first one. If you get those walls down, that's a good start. That's exactly what they're trying. In terms of stacks, by the way, 13 on Gul'dan. Well, it's definitely a few more right now. At level 10, that's the problem, the big one for LFT, because that could be where Quick Bless Shield forces another fight and maybe leads to another kill. If Washed Up plays it that aggressively. And yep, there they have level 10. Are they gonna go for it? Doesn't seem like it. Billy also has to be careful because he eats a lot of that corruption there. But they're starting to rotate down. And it's a small lead. It's really just a small lead experience that they have here. The Quasar has 34 gems, so he's obviously the one that they would love to take down. Unlikely to happen though. 20, actually 30 on Masquerade. Another prime target for them. But both teams can turn in. And a double turn in on level 10 for Washed Up would be fantastic. So if they can get that, then they have even more momentum on the map. Well, there's level 10 abilities now for both teams. Only 8 gems short. The arrow and the kill after the horrify. Fan fucking tastic ult by Gul'dan, and that is an easy kill. Mena down, didn't have his baseline or his level 1 quest completed yet, and therefore nothing to be done about it. But there comes the interrupt potential as the channel goes through. One interrupt in, 37 for the Quasar. Do they have the flashlight? No, nope, but they have the Tyrannus stun, and actually Banana H is low. Oh, the sanctification saves him, but there comes the quick Void Prison, trying to cancel that out. Smexy eats the Gul'dan corruption damage on the other hand, and that, wow, he actually survives for another second, but he dies regardless. So did Malfurion, though. So we have one hero eliminated on each side, and now... <laughs> Haha, <laughs> Mena with a revenge kill and Masquerade goes down with 42 gems. 
full T2 gems eliminated and damn they just lost so much oh that hurts that hurts yeah that's the feeling uh, when daddy comes home and tells his kids listen I know we had a bit of a college fun for you, but I gambled it all away. Teriel goes down, loses all the gems, and therefore potentially the future of his team. And, yeah, washed up. They're yeah, like that loan shark that comes in for the money and says, well, we get our next turn in. Get the red web weavers in. We have the siege giants at the bot lane, and now you're going to pay, guys. LFT is on the receiving end of a bit of a beating that's happening here. Six kills against three and half a level away from level 13 talents. And that push is going to be difficult to stop. This one is going to be very, very rough. With this many gems lost and a second web weaver wave now coming through, it's going to be tough to stop this one. There should be several forts that fall now. At the bottom of the map, as we're seeing, we already have this one pretty much pretty much down. I mean, nobody's even trying to save that. As you can tell in the mid lane, a similar picture presents itself. And now we have level 13 talents too, which gives us the Pyromaniac for uh, Kelthas. Torbos goes down, and the Sank didn't do anything for them here either. Great setup from uh, Johanna as Billy went for the Blessed Shield and Mena followed it up right away. Great job by them, and now they are moving even through their middle. They won't go for the keep yet, but they can definitely take the wall down. And at the bottom, as you can tell, we're seeing the Quasar with 45 gems now, trying to stop the worst from happening. Ah. Oh, oh, oh. Malfurion, Banana Age, damn son. Yeah, that is one squishy banana. He's not really made for this one. And, well, do we see the boss call? Well, seems like it. With the support down, they're just simply going for boss. They have full vision in the middle of the map still. They know where everybody is positioned. They're just saying, like, yep, free boss. Let's take that, baby. All right. There's a quick push for this one. And that boss is going to be taken with ease. The owl also connects down here. Just to make sure that they know where everybody is positioned. Keep in mind, they had also still the Void Prison up, so they could have delayed it for even longer. But the boss is taken, and you all know what that means. This is pretty much the end of the top fort. Now, there is at least a Web Weaver Wave that's coming into play now for the blue team. So they have a bit of pressure against their opponent, but it should still easily defend them. The bot lane in particular is the one that they have to poke out, and Hazob is going to be rewarded with a few gems there. And yeah, this makes in Mena already sitting here. Leo still on 12 gems. And besides that, 23 on Kolios. Oh. This is still a map where that can be pretty insane. But, yeah. I told that story in the past. Like, uh, I actually played a quick match once where we were just like funning around, and there was one guy on the other side, uh, on our team actually, that yelled at us the entire time. He's like, turn in your gems, turn in your gems. As we really see another kill here. Uh, Tobos goes down indeed. God, what a great setup for washed up here. 16 is nearly there for them. And now they have even another kill. But yeah, so that guy kept yelling that we should turn in the gems even though we were leading by three levels and we're just funning around. And we actually started lying to him and told him, it's like, dude, we want to get the special mount. We want to get the secret quest. And he's like, what secret quest? What special mount? And it's like, well, it's that spider mount that you can get here. It's like, oh, the spider mount. I've seen that mount. How do you get that? And we're like, well, all you have to do is you have to carry a hundred gems on this map and then you get that mount unlocked. And he was just absolutely on board with that and started to collect gems the entire time. And we were obviously lying through our teeth and just having fun with that. And as the game was about to end and we were homing in on the core, he was at 95 gems. And the entire time he was just saying like, guys, I need more gems, I need more gems. And he was like, don't end the game, don't end the game, please. And we was like, dude, we're just lying through you the entire time because you were an asshole all game long. And we just wanted you to shut up and it worked like a charm. And yeah, he wasn't really happy for that. So yeah, we got on top of that a couple of reports. But it was honestly one of the funnest, mo the funniest moments ever. It was the easiest way to shut that guy up. So if you ever want to try something fun in a quick match, there's an idea for you but yeah either way nine kills against three right now there's a big lead and there's another web weaver wave coming through that's time for the first keep to fall I would assume jungle at the top lane has also pushed in so that worked and there we have the keep destroyed they don't even have even 16 it's a two level lead and a talent advantage 
There's a Void Prison just as the Horrify comes down. That was unfortunate for Gul'dan. If that was planned by Smexy, then uh, fantastic, but I doubt that. That seemed to be like an unlucky moment. Hanzo goes down and does the kill against Tyriel. He's dead too. Nain is just firing away. More salami plays from Kalthas and the kill against Gul'dan. That should have sealed the deal right there. Double keep down. Webweaver down at the bottom and they're starting to go straight in for the middle. That core is going to fall. Dequaza has 63 gems. He wants to give his girlfriend a special present apparently and is collecting gems for that. Smexy has a problem with that and is trying to take him down. Might still work, but the core falls first. And that is the end of game number two. Washed up takes the second game in the best of five and ties the series as we head into game number three. Game number three, we are in Infernal Shrines and we're off to a good series. So yeah, LFT against Washed Up and Mena could fire away on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Maybe he can fire away here with the same hero again since Infernal Shrines is obviously another map where Kalthas gets some value. Uh, but yeah, with that we're now having uh, Good old Dibbles banned out again. Seems a little bit like a trend. Diablo getting banned out against Masquerade. Alarak getting banned out against Mena. I think I've seen this pattern before. So, yeah. What else are we going to get? So you usually have the ban on Ana. And we've seen LFT. I mean, honestly, what do you ban out here? From LFT's perspective. Uh, first pick, first ban. Is again on the side of LFT. And there's the Ana ban. Okay. And what does Washed Up get rid of? My F. Same setup that we had in game number two. Same bands here for them again. So okay, with that, we are currently looking at our first pick again. Hanzo? I mean, they picked Hanzo whenever they had a chance. Unless they are mixing things up and go for an early, I don't know, Toronda or maybe even a tank. A new Burak is still open and can be played, but it's Zeratul, all right. Dibbles is banned out. Question now is, are you going to try and take Jaina away from that? Or are you absolutely okay if they go into a Void Prison and Ring of Frost set up? Could still pick, for example, Tyrael and play around that. But yeah. Now we have our first double pick here for Washed Up. Hanzo gets taken. And there's the Tyrana pick. So if LFT don't goes for the heroes, Washed Up is happy to pick them up. That's the moment when you have to ask, is it going to be Jaina? Is that Ring of Frost coming out? Are they going to go for the combo? Zeratul plus Jaina was always a menace, but again, if you split well as Zeratul is looking for the Void Prison, you can make a lot of plays around that. A new Burak would also cater for Jaina. Again, AoE on the map for the Ring of Frost, afterwards for the Shrines, and there she is! Alright, girls in play! A new Burak is in as well. It's a good setup. So Again, it's Telegraph what you're trying to do with it, obviously, but that doesn't make it weak. That still is a stronger one. Now the only question is what gets banned. I would assume that we're going to talk side... Well, I guess Malfurion could be banned out too. Just to make sure that they don't have that lockdown available. So that's definitely an option. If you don't ban Malfurion, then the offlane is probably more so going to be your target area. And it's Malfurion. Malfurion gets banned out. Okay. And what else? There's the Tyrael ban. And why? Because of the Void Prison and Ring of Frost setup. As I said before, Tyrael can be picked to play against that. Could still ban out a couple of other things. I mean, first of all, if you're trying to interrupt the combo by any means, additional stuns against Zeratul or Jaina would already work, no matter what it is. And Nuburak normally has at least a cocoon that it can fire up. They don't have that here. Muradin together with Taranda. And we have Leo again in play, which puts us into the damage on Smexy's side. I honestly feel that we're going to get Genji, and I don't even know why, it just feels like that's something that Smexy would like to play here together with Mena and Hanzo. I'm probably completely wrong there, but currently I just feel that Smexy is advocating for a Genji pick. But either way, we have Raxa now taken for the offlane against Leo, so it's going to be a lot of stats padding for Hazwops as it's going to be draining Misha all day long. And in comes Alex Straza. This is the one map together with, I guess, Volskaya, where we see that hero a little bit. It's not China here. We are still looking at Europe. China, the hero, is a lot more popular. And there we go. LFT. Done with their setup. What is Mexico going to go for? 
What do we have from the Smex Master as we're heading into our third game? And which team will take the lead here in this best of five? And Smexy is playing... Oh, Smexy is playing Hanzo probably. And I guess Mena jumps onto Kalthas. I would assume that they switch two around. But yeah, there we have our Kalthas pick again. I'm game. All right, let's go, ladies and gentlemen. Game number three between Washed Up and LFT. Game number three. LFT against Washed Up, Infernal Shrines, and Masquerade is on a Nubarak right now. Tobos on Jaina, Kolios on Zeratul, Banana H on Alex Straza, and we have Dequaza on Rexa. And on the other side, washed up with Hazoops on Leoric, X-Ray on Toronda again, Main on Kelthas, Smexy on Hanzo, and Sport Billy on Muradin. Okay, it is time to shine. A little bit of mirror in action in this game as we are waiting for those storm bolts to connect. Toronto would obviously love to follow that up with an additional hit. And there's a lot of CC again. I mean, you're talking about not own. Uh, well, first of all, once the old sign. There's even more, but even before that, you have a Muradin Stormbolt into a Tyrannistan, into a Gravity Lapse, and that is definitely a lot of CC that you can stack if you play it properly out. So with this, we're now having uh, a setup where we're again seeing uh, just a bit of a uh, five-man here in the middle. Even Hazops is sticking around for just a bit to see if he needs to uh, push in slightly. Billy, on the other hand, as you can tell here, went into the third wind on level one, so gets the increased health duration. Honestly, personally, I like the Talon a lot. Perfect Storm is normally what we're seeing, but generally speaking, how much damage are you really going to get out of that? If you just want to be that frontline at the tank that doesn't necessarily rely on the damage output, but just wants to have the sustainability, take a little bit of the pressure off your support, then that Talon is definitely a great choice there. And Uberok also with the Regeneration Master, by the way. So he's also looking at the extra health re regeneration, the 500 health that he gets with the completion. Which is pretty good too. So for now, we're currently seeing uh, the attack at the bottom for the camps. And yeah, Zaratul is slightly, uh, slightly zoned out here. Billy is jumping in. And yeah, they want this. The camp got already taken, but they want to at least have a kill. And they're going for Tobos. They're actually not going for the same target. Yet yeah, Mena is all of a sudden down. And can Masquerade at least be dropped? No, it doesn't seem like it. So far, Alexstrasza is go doing well, keeping everybody alive. Billy jumps out, and we have the first kill of the game. Mena went down as LFT got the first blood here. And in addition to that, they also got the camp itself, the Kazra camp. Kazra Impalers are taken, and the second ones are already attacked here too. And without Mena, they can't really make a play for that either. Uh, it was a little bit too early to get anything out of this one. But there we have it. Subterranean Shield is going to come in on level 7 as we already have the uh, the under, uh, under King taken for the Burrow Charge increase. Heavy Aggression. With this setup, you definitely want to dive in deep and get those kills against the backline. Also, Olio still with the attack against Hazorps up at the top side. There's already a bit of a push out. So as they spend more resources to pressure the mid lane, we're having Dequaza in a position where he has a bit more time top side. And there's currently nobody... Moving up top, Main is now starting the rotation, but the Shrine is already announced. Bot lane, Hanzo is sitting there against Masquerade, still poking out against that. And the two camps are already attacked too. So both the Shaman camps are going to join on the top lane. Obviously it is a top lane Shrine too, so there's limited value that they will get, at least usually that is. And we have our little setup here as Billy is already starting to take the side here. They're hoping for a flank, obviously. Main is already moving in, starting to burn things down. And the Salami Master is still trying to get to level 7 for the Pyromaniac. And that level 7 talent is something that both of the teams are hoping for when it comes to objective number 1. And that's why Leo is still in the middle of the map, trying to get a, a lead for his team. And they're actually starting to give up completely on that first objective. Because now with 19 stacks, we're seeing them move a hero down to the bottom of the map and still having Leo mid-side. So now they're giving this one up. They're saying objective number one, you know what? We don't really care. They're totally fine here. So Leo is anchoring the play of Manus Kelthas. So they're going to get this camp. All they want to do is get level 7 and then defend topside 
try and get a bit of an experience lead somehow. But there's the level 7 ability on the side of LFT. And with that, as predicted, we are seeing the subterranean shield. Alright, let's see how much damage it can get with it. Obviously the protector is going to be... Uh, the Punisher is going to be baited over. Heroes all behind the gate. Attack the Protector to give him vision. He's going to trigger the stun. And yeah, that didn't quite work out. Uh, neither the Stormbolt nor the Clap gave vision. And now they're going to lose a lot more here than they are supposed to. That is a pretty atypical mistake for this level of play. That usually doesn't happen, but in this case it actually did. So yep, they're losing a lot more. They're actually getting wrecked here. That's, they're gonna lose this fort. And they might lose Billy too. Billy barely jumping out and Coleus is already behind him and says like, Nope, you're not gonna get away from this one. So, yep, that should be another kill. And... <laughs> there we go. That was pretty bad by Washdown. Let's be honest. That was not really all too good. So, all of a sudden, two kills against zero, one fort gone. And if they can get another kill against me, that would be pretty bad too. But obviously, Corleos is not on a on a level where he can get that kill secured yet. Either way, we're having uh, up at the uh, bottom of the map. More globes also taken for Rexa, who's currently with a hunter gatherer, sitting at 10 stacks. He wants the extra armor from Misha and for himself. And yeah. Uh, Experience, it's not that much of a lead, but again, it can turn quickly. Jaina is a bit low on everything. Mana, hit points. That's why Tobos is currently moving out there. Okay, and he comes to the attack against Sport Billy. Uh, and he gets out. But he has taken a beating. This is really where his level 1 comes into play. That's where the action starts for him. Masquerade. <laughs> Both of them not going in there. And Masquerade is just sitting in the bush and is just saying, like, I see you. But uh, can't really do anything about that though. So that was a little bit, a little bit unfortunate for them. Yeah, and a lot of the quests are actually going to be completed in a second. But also we have level 10 abilities and there's a Void Prison. And there's the Ring of Frost and the Insta Double Kill. Yep, that didn't work out for them at all. Quite unfortunate. If your opponent with that setup hits level 10, you want to be far away from the action. And, well, they moved out a little bit too far, and they get insta-punished for that. If you give Zeratul an opportunity for that VP, he's definitely going to take it. So, another big problem as the mid-wall gets broken through, the fountain eliminated. Big arrow comes out, on the other hand, Mena wants the kill, and Mena gets the kill. Mena gets the kill right there. Can they follow it up with a second? Ah, there's an Entomb, there's a Stormbolt, and there's a second kill. All right, Jaina down, and so is Zeratul. So it's the immediate revenge kills against him. But obviously, the structural position on the map has now changed quickly. Having uh, two lanes heavily attacked. One at least still holds the fort, but it still hurts. So... Uh, Murdin on 11 stacks also now on his baseline, thanks to those kills that came in after the Stormbolt. Plus, in addition to that, we're having 13 stacks for Mena, who's obviously going to be a lot safer once that he has a completed quest talent or quest reward there. Shrine is activating, and, well, outside of the advantage in uh, structures, which are in pretty good position here for, for Washed Up, all things considered. I mean, they're even in experience right now. And they're trying to pull ahead too as they are setting Mena down to the bot side. Uh, Kolios still eats quite a bit of the damage. Mena on the other hand is rather low too, so he needs some heals. And X-Ray is already getting in position to deal with that and heal him up here. Mena is the one that has most of the AoE, but he still does not have the quest completed. It makes him vulnerable in this fight. And Rexa just did 8 minutes in the extra armor for Misha and himself as the team start to poke. Heavily, I might add. Only one team has taken the Shaman camp, and that is actually LFT, who have catapults at the top lane as well. Uh, that VP didn't do uh, anything, so uh, that didn't work out. This, on the other hand, definitely did. There's the kill, and Zeratul. Yeah, they still get mana, don't they? No, they do not. Wow. But Hazorps falls. But that's still Leo. And Leo's going to come back on the point again. So, again, if you lose a hero in a fight like this, you want to lose Leo. So that still works out. 15 against 14. There's the Dragon Queen on the other hand. That's a different story. Banana H popping the tray, trying to secure this Punisher. And that's going to be an Arcane Punisher too. Smexy still with the Pope. Mena doing quite the same. Trying to get the Flame Strike through, but the lead is there for LFT now. 
and they want to go for Muradin. Billy, the avatar, they go for Masquerade. Oh, and Anubarak dies. Anub is down, but the double kill against Leo and Muradin. Both of them dead. Mena also stopped, slowed, attacked, followed, and barely gets out as X-Ray keeps him in play. The camp on the top side, breaking through the wall at the keep, though. And it seems like we're going to have another Punisher for LFT. Yes, they get the Arcane Punisher now. The keep at the top lane is starting to take damage, too. And despite the best efforts of Washed Up, they are still behind in this game. Level 13 gives them the Pyromaniac for Mana, so the cooldown reduction. Also the Ominous Wraith. But now Mana has to start dealing with the top wave. He has the AoE and he's using it right away. But things are getting dicey. Ford the top lane down, for the, the bot lane about to be eliminated. The one in the middle severely suffering. I don't know. Kalthos on 16,000 damage. That's the rotation. Already the cocoon. And that should be the end of the Fire Mage. Salami. Uh, gets the Phoenix out at least, but that is Mena down. Then again, the Frost Mage has also fallen as the two teams are singing us a little song of ice and fire here. And yep, that's the end of Jaina. Can they also drop the Beetle? Masquerade tries to jump away, has the subterranean shield. More damage coming out. Hazorp's coming in with the slows as he swiffers away. The maze to the face and Alexstrasza is dead. Big wave at the bot lane that someone would probably love to catch there soon. But currently that's not the case. Uh, well, half a level ahead. It's a weird game. Eight kills against six, and it's just an endless back and forth. Billy's jumping out again. Kolos is going in for another hit, but can obviously not really threaten Muradin. Doesn't even activate his avatar because he doesn't have to. Hazel's down at the bottom of the map again, trying to make his plays right there. But still, it is getting spicy in this game. Honestly, I mean, we still have kill against kill. Every single time that LFT is taking a lead through a kill or two, there's a reaction. There's always a bit of counter. And level 16 is going to be very, very good for Washed Up. 20 gives them Buried Alive. And again, we are, I mean, it's a little bit like being on a broken record every single time that we're talking about Leoric in this case, but it's such a game changer when you have um, uh, Buried Alive. It's one of the best ults in the game. I mean, seriously, low cooldown and insanely high impact. But also on top of that, Mena is about to complete his level 1 quest, and that's going to help him. He's not the only one, though. Anubarak is only one single globe away from getting 500 additional hit points. Rexa, he is definitely the worst actor on uh, the entire planet. It's one of the reasons why Hollywood just doesn't hire him. I also was told that he just doesn't have the right politics for that, but I mean, that's only a rumor. But his feigned death highlights very reliably how bad of an actor he is, because let's face it, nobody falls for that shit. He still takes it very reliably every single time he hits level 16. But now also we're seeing the Cleave Talents coming through for Zeratul, so that's going to help him. Billy with another Storm Bolt connected. And obviously on top of that we now have the Epicenter and... Numbing Blast. Numbing Blast as well. And here comes the next shrine, soon going to be announced. Arrow, or well the Owl comes through. Mena actually goes into Ignite, okay. After his level 7 talent, I was actually expecting him to go into the Fury of the Sun well here, but far from it. So Ignite instead it is. And uh, we're gonna go for the next big battle with Mena also now completing his quest. And that gives him a little shield. They're going to time this, but this is gonna make him a lot safer in the next fight. And yeah, with that, what else do we have here? Obviously sh on the move straight into the middle again. Zaratul and Leo still at the bottom. It's gonna be taken any second. Mena wants to time it and delay it a little bit more. Yep, there's one Shaman Camp already claimed. Second one about to come in. Six seconds on uh, the temple. There it is. Mena completes the quest. Can go up for another quick flame strike. Takes that catapult down. Yeah, and they're starting to take that wave down to, uh, too. So that gives them a slight lead on the top lane at least. Relieves the pressure. Everything is up for grabs now when it comes to that protector, to that punisher. The boys, they want it. And there's the Ford in the middle, taking severe damage. In comes the stun against Torbos. He doesn't have the ice block. 
and he gets destroyed. Also, Cocoon has been used against Kalthos, but that didn't change anything anymore. Yep, they're trying to get at least the stun in, but now the attempt to go for Zeratul too it didn't quite work out. But this situation is perfect for Washed Up. Washed Up is fighting back here. Eight kills against seven. Both of the teams are level 17, but all of a sudden, Washed Up is having a massive, massive momentum swing that they initiated in the game here. And they are going to try and carry that even farther with this first objective that they're going to win in this game. There's even more pressure thanks to the top. Billy needs to be careful, but she shouldn't have any trouble there. So now we're having Muradin also completing his quest. So now the cooldown reduction on the auto attacks is in play, plus Pierce. And that should help. Yeah, no Frost Ride, no Ring of Frost this time. No Void Prison setup. But those two ults are still ready. Masquerade, though. Oh, <laughs> yeah, eat damage, son. Oh, but he gets out. Yeah, the Protector, the Punisher in the middle, on the other hand. And it's the first four down. I mean, seriously, this is the first one that they are going to get. So they jump in for this one, Ford eliminated, Hazo busy at the bot lane, they are soon going to take over the lead in experience, despite the fact that they already lost two Fords. Uh, but they're jumping in again down here, and there's just Mena with damage, 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 and Anubarak gets oh, nearly locked down. Nearly locked down by that Storm Ball that got thrown out by Billy, if that one connects and he's down. But here comes the setup attempt. But Jaina gets completely screwed. Completely wrecked. Was trying to get in position for the VP so that she can get the Ring of Frost connected after it gets released, but nope. Wasn't even close. They immediately once Zeratul dropped the VP, started to focus in on Jaina. Hazorps dropped the void as uh, dropped the the entomb and blocked them out, and then it was just damage stacked on top of damage with additional stuns coming in. Easy kill for them. It's a great series. Honestly, this series so far has been just fantastic. Back and forth the entire time, starting with game number one on Towers of Doom. And here in game number three, we still see the continuous poke as both teams have the exact same amount of kills. They're looking extremely similar in structures on the map too. And we have only the tiniest of leads in experience for Washed Up. They're closing on level 20 right now. And LFT, they are looking for a way back into this because they have lost a lot of momentum and the entire trend of this game is leaning towards Washed Up because they are the ones now with the Tomb soon coming up. Yeah, and already the attempt to control the map even further as we see that little attack by Leo. And at the bottom of the map, another fort is about to be taken down. And it's not only the fort, I mean, it's also the fountains being eliminated. That's the level 20. Yep, and that means... Buried alive, baby! And goodbye, Anubarak. Anubarak down. They're gonna try and go for Tobos too. That's the slow. Stormo doesn't connect. Ah, nice move though. Going straight up against Hazops here. That nearly led to a kill against Leoric. Well, it's not quite happening, but they're pushing this farther. They have level 20. It's 20 against 20 now, but they still have the advantage of Anubarak uh, being taken apart. And at the top side, at least, we're having that push out by Dequaza. So they're playing it a little bit safer. They're also still thinking about trying to save the fort in the middle of the map. We're having Flamethrower taken for Kel'Thas, so it's going to be much safer from the backline now. Bullseye and Rewind. Whereas on uh, the side of the red of the blue team, Shadow Mending, Ice Blink. Still no Ice Block, by the way. And Rewind now taken as well. Ah... Uh, well, Stormbolt potentially. Billy jumps out. Again, he doesn't have perfect Stormbolt level 1, so it's going to be a bit more stingy with those storm balls. But let's look at the damage. Let's take a quick look at that. 36 and 35,000 on Hanzo and Kalthas. 28k on uh, Zeratul. And 23,000 on Rexa. Uh, Misha's delivering here. Heal, Misha. Heal. All right. And there we go. This could, in theory, be the last big fight of the game. Depends a little bit on how it goes. Uh, but this is an opportunity to end the game potentially for the teams, depending on how many heroes they can kill here. And it's again an Arcane Punisher that we're talking about. Sport Billy already with the aggressive stance forward, making sure that he is zoning everybody out and anchoring the place there. Uh, stuns come in. Billy wasn't even forced to go into Avatar just yet. There's a Dragon Queen buried alive, already used, zoning them out nicely. Yeah, so far, so good. There's the avatar. Immediate cocoon on the other side. And there's the VP. VP is in. Jaina is not coming in just yet. The arrow connects. Oh, but Hazo is low. The problem is that Zeratul is already dead. Hazo! 
Leo is still alive. The ring didn't do anything. And the Stormbolt still connects here too. Misha is down. Sprawl on the floor. That's a pelt for the gallery right here. One for the wall. And Mena is active on the shrine as they are trying to look for another big Punisher. And that Arcane Punisher should go through that bot lane like hot butter through cheese. Mena is already moving into the middle as well, is pushing even more lanes out top side. That's where we're seeing Leo dealing with Dequaza's pressure as he's trying to at least get some counter pressure against the keeps. Good luck with that. Two stacks missing, 440, and they are going down for the bottom of the map now to add another Kazura camp to the push. Mirrodin just sitting tight. The aggression again as they're trying to force their hand here and trying to force that quickly. Well, yep, we don't see it just yet. Pokes keep coming. One single stack is missing. Misha is dead again. Billy jumps in. They take it and they try to go for Dequaza. Stun, bullseye, body blocks, Dequaza. And there's the hit, feigning his death again. Nobody falls for that crap, dude. We told you already. He's down. And over here, the Punisher jumps into a big arrow at the choke point. And Alex Straza is dead. Zeratul falls, but so does Anubarak. And Zeratul himself. Well, actually, Zeratul has fallen a little bit later than I told, said here. But he dies anyways. Anubarak and Jaina have also fallen. And with that five-man team wipe in play, the bot lane is attacked. The mid lane is also getting wrecked here by the catapult. But this should actually be game as Washed Up is about to win two in a row and take the lead in the best of five series here off Division S. What a setup there once again. And Washed Up definitely made angry after game number one when the French took their first victory in this series. So this is going to set us up for a lead for the red team as we are heading into game number four of the series. GG and well played as Washed Up takes Infernal Shrines. Game four. Washed up. Looking good right now. I gotta admit though, at the beginning of the game, LFT played better and then Washed Up was able to bring it back in the later stages, but the first few objectives, they didn't really stand a chance on Infernal Shrines. They got a bit outplayed there. Now we have our fourth map and it could potentially be the last one in this series. Washed Up is obviously eager to end it all here and to take Battlefield of Eternity, which also is their map choice so yeah first pick first ban again goes to lft the losing team can pick so they chose to have first pick first ban over the map choice and washed up decided in favor of battlefield of eternity is so a little bit more brawling going on very likely and that brings us back even to vala that can potentially be played we could in theory see a gray man which we've actually seen from quite a few teams recently one of them being wind and rain to just name one but we have gray man appear on this map a little bit more often now Ana gets banned out. Are we going to see that ban against Diablo again? Diablo and Maiev have been the stable bans for Washed Up in the previous games now. And there's the Dibble's ban. Okay, so once again, they're just looking at Masquerade and they're like, mm -mm, you're not getting your hero. And yeah, there's the Ana ban early on. And what else are we going to see banned out? I mean, again, over here, Hansa as a first pick is once more an option on both sides. And with first pick, first ban ready for LFT, I kind of expect them to go for that. And that would leave Taranda open uh, for uh, Washed Up to be taken. There's still the Alarak ban for LFT. They don't change the demo. But yeah, we could see an Anubarak early pick from uh, Washed Up and Taranda. Always assuming that LFT go into the early Hanzo. If not... Then it's going to be a little bit reversed. Then that Hanzo pick is very likely going to be appear on the side of Washed Up. So let's see how this is going to play out. Is it going to be Hanzo or are they shifting into something else instead and maybe get that in Nuburak or Tyrande for themselves here? That's at least the pattern that we've so far seen emerge most of the time with both of the teams. Battle of the Eternity highlights the two again. And there's the Hanzo pick. Okay. And now on the other side, is it going to be a Nuburak and Tyrande? Or are we shifting away from that setup and getting something differently? Now you want to have, of course, something that deals with the objective. We haven't seen a Liming yet, by the way. Just saying. There's the Anubarak. Could still see a Liming now, too. Again, some teams even pick her in the first pick position these days. Especially Wind and Rain, but others as well. And there's a chance for her to be taken. Or it's going to be that Tyrande pick again. There we go. Tyrande gets taken. 
But I wonder if you want to see where Li Ming lands in this game. In some of the previous maps, it made sense to not go for Li Ming, and some of the setups didn't really cater towards her as well as other picks that were a higher priority. But when you talk about Battlefield of Eternity, she is usually a fantastic choice. And against the Nuburak, she is, as mentioned before, quite powerful because she can burn that cocoon down so quickly. And she has the continuous poke against the immortal. So, yep, there we have it. Immediately taken. So the Li Ming is already claimed. That also gives us Malfurion for Banana Age. Now it's time for the bans. And, well, with that, we can still ban the front line out. Can eliminate that for now. And now thinking about what Wash Up is going to take here. I mean, you can still go around Jaina. I just feel like they have been shifting away from her a little bit. For Mena and Smexy, there is still enough room to go for Genji on the map. Greymane is still an option. But uh, let's see, the ETC ban is actually not too bad either. Given what Masquerade has been playing so far, this is Battlefield. ETC is strong. He can stun into the Normortal stun, even push back into it. So that's always kind of nice if you have someone that controls that nice, uh, like well and is able to play around that. And a good ETC player will be able to do that, uh, Masquerade being one of them. So that was a good ban. That's a Zeratul ban. Not giving Smexy that hero. We haven't really seen any Genji yet, but I would assume that in this game we could actually get that. It was. Yeah, there's my Greyman pick. Again, talked about it earlier. Greyman is in. Hazorps, are we going to see that Sergeant Hammer at some point coming in from him? They've oftentimes played with that. But right now, they, they shift roles obviously slightly because they have pretty much X-Ray and Smexy that usually play support. And Hazu finds himself on the off lane, so no Hammer for him. Instead, we're seeing Rexa. And there we go. If Hammer is taken... Well, it's actually too late. They have two damage dealers already. Triple damage is garbage, has been garbage, and will always be garbage for a long time. Outside of that one game in 10,000. Uh, yeah, but if Hammer would be appearing on LFT side, I'm pretty sure that Mina would go into Gul'dan because he played that hero previously against Hammers on this map and wrecked the opponent. So now we have Arthurs and Muradin taken. And we only need Mina. Is it still going to be Gul'dan despite the fact that we don't have any kind of like Hammer player on the other side? Or what is Mina going to... Done. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Chromie! Okay! Very, very limited success from Chromie so far in the past, but Mena goes in and drops the, the Gnome, the Sand Gnome. Let's see if that works out. Battlefield of Eternity, it could be the last map, unless LFT takes it and forces the fifth. So let's go straight into BOE. Game on! As we head into Battlefield of Eternity, Masquerade on Murden, Dequaza on Arthurs, Banana Age on Malfurion, Kolios on Hanzo, and Tobos on Leeming. And on the right side of the map, Hazorps on Rexa, X-Ray on Tyrande, Mena on the Sand Gnome. We're having Smexy on Greymane, and Sport Billy on a Nuburag. All right, let's get ready to rumble. What do we have here? Level one, it's once again the first time. All righty. Uh, well, Chromie tells us from her sexual escapades here, we are double checking what the rest of the setups take. And on level one, we have the extra wave clear from the Bird of Prey. Uh, getting the extra damage in against the minions. And Muradin actually went so far to go straight for block on level 1 now against Greyman. A little bit worried about that damage output there. And I mean for good reason. Greyman can of course be an absolute destroyer of frontline tanks, but also quite strong when it comes to the Immortal in particular, which is what we talked about earlier. It's a pretty cool skin for Chromie, by the way. It's like one of the best, if not the best, Chromie skin, seriously. The animations that come with it are just fantastic. And nearly make me like the hero. So uh, we'll see if that is going to be enough to uh, turn this around. If there are good stuns, then the follow-up damage could be kind of nice. But so far, the story of Chromie ever since her two attempted reworks has pretty much been that, yes, she is able to get decent damage out, but she is pretty much losing 90% of the games that she's played. So that has been Chromie's story. She's been played multiple times. Not a lot, don't get me wrong, but she's been played a couple of times. And every single time, she had decent damage. She usually died a lot, despite the damage output, and at the end of the day, she won pretty much 10%, and that's about it. So, yeah. 
Either way, we'll see if this game is going to be different. On level 4, we have now the chronic conditions. And, well, I would say that Chromie herself is a chronic condition. At least when you're on the opponent's side. Nine stacks already on the level 1. Rexa goes down at the top as they started to rotate a hero over. And two, actually. So washed up losing the top laner is a bit of an issue. And that means that down at the bottom of the map, they're having that little setup here against Muradin again with the damage. And... Yeah, nearly. Nearly set up. So, yeah, top side. Bobo's going to be able to push this through down at the bottom of the map. The continuous poke is still there. And, yep, yeah, with that, we're having now uh, an opportunity to maybe even break through the entire wall as Hazo is back towards the top side with Rexa. And especially that one is down. Yes, one turret eliminated, the gate halfway down. Second turret about to be eliminated too. And, uh, dominance on Liming. Uh, both teams going for the camps. And obviously it's all about the preparation for the next objective. Which is, as it happens, the first objective. So in this case, the added echoes are actually going to come in pretty soon if Mena keeps this up. I mean, so far we haven't even seen the first objective where he should get additional stacks. But yeah, still just fire away pss, pss, the entire time here. Masquerade is already trying to move in and the Stormball is getting dodged and that's Hanzo down. All right, Hanzo eliminated. Romy by now going for the proper greeting. Pretty much the stunner talent on level 7. And there are enough stuns and slows on their side that they can really capitalize on this. And they're burning away that wall and that camp very, very easily. And we're still seeing the top lane pressure against Aquaza as Misha is going through again. And damn, Arthas is actually taking quite the beating here. Down here on the other hand, still the uh, zone out by Sport Billy. They're making the plays straight for the Immortal. And they're actually getting solid damage against it. Greyman in particular is just absolutely ripping this thing apart. Just clawing into it one hit after another. And that halftime show is theirs without any problems whatsoever. Top side also value since this entire thing has already fallen with the exception of a single turret. And now obviously Chromie can still poke from a distance here. 18 stacks by now for Mena on Chromie. And we're having them go for the Immortal pretty easily. Kolios on the left side is trying to put Hanzo into play to at least turn this around. And Hanzo has obviously some fantastic clear on that beast. But yeah. Talking beasts, Smexy on Greymane, wants to make the engage happen, starts jumping in, Chromie again with the hits, sitting at 18 here, and nearly the elimination of the Immortal, but they're trying to go for the Ronda, and X-Ray goes down, Chromie with a big hit again, and Smexy follows up on it with a quick kill, but the Quasa is already on the job, trying to eliminate Smexy, he gets the kill, he himself then again is most likely gonna fall too, they're trying to save Arthur's, but Arthur's is no way actually getting out. <laughs> oh, and the Immortal is also lost. The Hanzo Factor kicks in, and that is that. Oh, yeah. That is unfortunate for the red team. Chromion 15,000 damage. Again. The damage output on her end is normally not bad. It's the problem of how much can she deliver to the game. And right now it's just not enough yet. But then again, it's early in the game. That's the first thing. And the second is obviously that without the level 1 quest completed, her damage output is still a bit limited. So, yep. With this, we're now having the bot lane heavily attacked. Arthas is up at the top against Rexa again. So it's a 4 versus 4 here at the bottom side. They're starting to take that Immortal down, but in comes Muradin. Uh, good damage against him. The immediate stun from X-Ray on Taranda. And they take that Immortal down pretty quickly. And now they're trying to go for Banana Age. And guess what? He is dead too. Chromie has now the time loop. Billy, Billy. And they could get that loop against Muradin. Mena trying to close the distance, but his mana pool is also pretty much depleted. He tries to hit a few more. 29 stacks now for him on the level 1. So, yeah. Ah, Billy is maybe a little bit aggressive with this. But again, as long as Mane is able to connect a couple of additional hits here, he is going to be able to get the second uh, Echo quite early. And that would be fantastic for them for the damage output. So it's four kills against three right now. Still a lead for Washed Up, but they lost the last Immortal. And Mane is in desperate need of increasing his hit point pool. Trying to win this one. Let's we'll see if they can. Oh, oh that was close. Murray was nearly on the point. Uh, they don't want to fight against the Kazaras and against the rest of the team. So most of them already moving back here. 
<laughs> it is all about immortal number two for now. 15 stacks also on Murden. Not bad. Not bad at all. For uh, six and a half minutes in this game. That's a pretty good quest progression that we have from him. Also, Arthur's is nearly done running his level four down to 150 or up to 150. So, picking good there. I already have the move into the middle again as the immortals are about to spawn and obviously there will be a deviation over to the shaman camps to try and take that. Bot lane, that's why we still have Chromie firing around here. Mena, I gotta say that I absolutely, that skin is, it's one of the, it's pretty much the only thing that makes me wanna play Chromie. And yeah, not a Chromie fan, again, but still working out for them right now. But this is now the time when, uh, first of all, Mena is gonna, has to try to complete his quest, and second of all, they have to try to take the Immortal, and Hanzo is going to attempt to make sure this isn't happening. So, level 10 abilities are in on both sides. Arrow, pretty quickly from Hanzo. That was a short distance arrow too. That didn't do anything for them. There's also the Cocoon straight up against Arthur's, so that didn't do all too much either. They try to get the stun out against it. 31 stacks for Chromie. And again, Mena is nearly there. He needs nine stacks. He is seven stacks away from completing his quest. And Arthur's is down as Greymane comes in and rips his throat out. So he is dead, and that Immortal isn't looking pretty either. Mena connecting more and more hits. This. Oh, another big hit! As Malfurion dead, and Tobos is also wrecked as Maxi showcases his DPS skills. And I gotta compliment Maxi a little bit today. I mean, damn, son. Usually he's on the support role, but he is killing it on the damage here, literally and figuratively. He's been doing really well in all of the games here, so good performance by him. Fought at the bot lanes in trouble and will actually fall, so this one goes down. But besides that, uh, having a bit of top lane value themselves now through that camp that they took earlier, and they just won the halftime show. And Mena is just simply five stacks away from getting his quest completed, and the second Sandblast Echo is definitely going to change things up a little bit. So both of the forts are down, thanks to the minions. The big fight is going to happen again over the objective, as the teams are both moving in, and Mena can now also rely on the timeout here. Yeah, damage comes through again, arrow misses completely, timeout has been used, the Quasar gets cocooned. And the shot this time didn't connect. There's the force already moving out. They're trying to go for Arthur's again. He still has the army up on the other hand. Pops it immediately, but he might not be able to survive here. And there's the kill. Chromie with the quest completion. Second Sandblast in action now. And also gets the Dragon's Breath connected. Looks like Banana Age is going to fall next. And yes, Malfurion is down. There's the damage from Chromie as she just fires away against Masquerade. Li Ming is down too. And it is an absolute disaster from the perspective of LFT. Kolios is rushing away. 50 HP for him. That doesn't look pretty for him at all. And yeah, he is caught between a rock and a hard place. And Smexy comes in and takes him down. Nicely done. So Masquerade is currently pausing the game. And it is quite understandable. They got burned so hard they need to apply a little bit aloe vera before they can continue the rest of the game. Those burns hurt. They definitely do. And honestly, if you receive the spanking like that in the last fight, then you kind of need to treat your bottom a little bit too. Because you won't be able to sit down for a while if you don't. And we all know how annoying it can be to play standing. Everybody has been in that spot at one point or another in their life where they are actually trying to uh, go to mouse and keyboard and not ta not sitting down for that and it really impacts the performance so given the situation i can absolutely understand that a quick pause was needed there malfurion dropping might have might have a little bit to do with it too but i doubt it's the real reason i think the real reason we all know what it is Welcome. and well he's back already that was a quick one so yep that also is nearly 100% immortal that we're now having. <laughs> so, pretty powerful one too. And that should actually be another fort at the bot lane. Honestly, depending on how well they do right now with that attack, and especially the level 13 talent that they're going to get any second, they should be able to also get potentially the keep. At least the wall. I mean, the wall is really the... That's really the minimum. But they should be able to make a play for the keep as well. Already they're making a play for Hazorps down here though. Yeah, he was trying to set himself up at the side. Can they get the counter kill? Yes! Mix is unstoppable today! 
This Mech Master going in, ripping them apart. And Chromie firing away. The attempted kill against Tyrande. X-Ray keeps himself alive. There's the time trap. Malfurion is down. Masquerade is about to get wrecked now too. Trying to make the play for Chromie. And Manage has absolutely shits on him. Gets every single spell connected. 15 kills against 5. Main is sitting at 40,000 damage. And they're absolutely destroying. Billy moving in. Trying to spawn the Beatles here. Colios is sitting at the side. Dequaza already moving in with a Howling Blast. As we're seeing Tobos coming from the Nexus once again. But the keep is already about to be taken down. They're still two levels behind. They don't have level 13 either. And that Immortal is still dropping damage. Dropping damage and trying to drop additional kills right here. As they're starting to go in for another mic drop play. Already X-Ray in the back line. And waiting for another stun. Sport Billy moving past the Immortal on the core. And it's definitely going to hurt it a little bit. If they try and make the play here. Billy at the front as the rest of the team is zoned out. Tobos moves in for the defense and they are rushing away from it. They accept the damage on the core. They're not trying to end right now. That core goes down to 85% as they're moving out. 15 kills against 5. One and a half level lead. 13 talents at least for the blue team now. That gives us the healing static. Great synergy with the level 4 of course as well. And in comes also Formena. The Shifting Sands. As if he needed more spell power. Smexy then again might have to move out of here. But they still have the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Why not? Let's try it. Uh, <laughs> Smexy? <laughs> okay. He nearly went 1v5. But yeah, the rest of the team is there too. So after he taps the fountain, they're definitely going to rejoin the fun. And here comes the party. Yeah, they go for Banana H to try to get the kill down here. Main again, nearly trying to run him down. Banana H though goes down and Arthurs is getting wrecked too. Easy double kill once again and they're not stopping there. They're actually going straight for the quad kill as Hanzo and Li Ming both fall. And now they're focusing onto the top. It looks like they might go for core. Well, the death timers are low. They're only 12 minutes into the game, but they're going for Muradin. Muru who? Yeah, exactly. He's down to a five-man wipe right there. Massive, massive push from Washed Up as they go for keep number two. Immortal has been announced now as well. But yep, only Arthas and Malfuria and are back to business. And this is just massive push coming from every single angle. Catapults on both lanes right now. Camps too. They're starting to focus in on the core. And they're starting to drop the damage right there. Poking away further and further. The arrow comes in, but that's not going to do enough. They're trying to go for the play with Tobos from the side. But Mena is still alive. Yep, gets the combo out as well. Smexy has to be careful. Li Ming then again was already about to be dropped. And just barely made it back to the Nexus. Day. Quaza gets cocooned right there. Misha is already dead. They're trying to go for Smexy. Jumps in, jumps out, tries to save himself. But there's the silence. And that is the end of Greymane. X-Ray with a stun, but Turbo survives. And all of a sudden, we're seeing LFT fight back heavily. Mena still gets the damage connected, but eats the storm while his Muradin goes in, and that looks like we're going to see a kill. Mena is low. Mena's in trouble, but the time trap keeps him alive. Turan, on the other hand, goes down as Li Ming went in for the kill, and the core is heavily attacked as LFT moves back to defend it. And Nubarak drops off the edge of the map here. And we're having still at the top the attack against Mena. And well, there's Muradin too, so that should be a kill. <laughs> there's... Uh, yeah, that's the end. Mena goes down. And yep, that is now 20 kills against 9. And all of a sudden a comeback as we have level 16 talents. And honestly... That might become a problem. Also what might become a problem is this heavy attack against the core. There's two of the catapults already hitting against it. Another one pushing through the bottom. The minion wave, thankfully for them, takes it down. The arrow misses completely, but Hazorps here feigning his death. We all know how that's gonna go, as we're having Greyman actually starting to move towards the core. I'm not quite sure if I agree with every of these plays that are being made here, and Smexy realizes that this is asking for a little bit too much, so they're jumping away. Yeah, they, they actually thought they had it already, I think. They might have overplayed their hand a little bit, and now they're risking that they're losing the Immortal completely here. So they were just trying to fun around. But of course, two keeps destroyed means continuous pressure. But that Immortal is gonna hurt. A lot. That's 100% shield Immortal that we're gonna get, get now. And over here, Muradin is trying to move in. There's a Cocoon. If they can get that kill, that would be insane. 
Can they get it though? There's a stun, there's the second, there's the damage. And at least they forced the avatar. Oh! <laughs> Smexy, you fucking monster. Jumps in on max range to run over the last hit, but damn, son. What an engage. And Nuburag is down too. The objective hasn't been taken yet, guys. And we have a double color pulled again on the core. Good arrow this time, and Smexy gets out. But, yep, the catapults are on the core again, and we're talking 16-minute catapults with the camp pushing through, too. And they have to get away from this one. Oh, and Li Ming is dead! Li Ming is dead, and that core is losing hit points in the seconds. Triple catapult right now. We are talking triple catapult, and they are trying to stop them. They might go for the core here. With Greyman in the mids, hell yeah. Hell yeah, they can try. But Mirrodin is back, so I'm not quite sure if they really want to take the risk here. The Punisher, uh, well, the Immortal is up at the top. 68%, 67%, they're not going for it yet. But they get the kill against Mirrodin. They take him down and they want more. They're going in again against the core, poking, trying to take it apart. Greyman, can they get him into action? If Smexy gets on the core, that's all that they need to do now. 50%, 50% on the core. Stasis on Chromie. Smexy going up against Equaza, 25%. This should be, this should be game. Arthurs goes down, and so does Malfurion. And this is a win? Hazo <laughs> Ops finishes it. A 3 1 victory for Washed Up against LFT in Division S. Hey guys, thanks for watching today's video and I hope that you enjoyed the match and the commentary. The remaining time of the video has been added to protect against spoilers caused by the length of the video itself. But please keep in mind though that this does not only mean more work for me but also has a negative impact on the popularity of the videos and the channel because of YouTube's algorithms. It would be greatly appreciated if you'd consider supporting the channel and help me to continue the daily esports coverage by clicking the join button below the video or supporting me through the Proterium page linked in the video description. Thanks a lot for the support and see you guys next time.